Thank you for coming. We continue our study this evening in the Psalms, as we especially are still in the early ones of the Psalms, in the book of Psalms, the ones that were written by David. And last time we completed our study of Psalm 22, describing a prophecy of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And tonight we're looking at Psalms 23 and 24. So please open your Bibles to Psalm 23. We have probably the best known of the Psalms, the one that most people are more familiar with than any of the others, uh, which describes God as a shepherd. Uh, so let's look at and read, first of all, read the Psalm and then we'll discuss it. But we'd like to read Psalm 23 for us, please. Psalm 23. Bill, please, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Okay. So it begins describing the Lord as his shepherd. So I ask you in the first question, what are some other passages that talk about God or the Father or Jesus as shepherd? And uh, well, let's throw off some scriptures. What are some scriptures that talk about the God or the Father as shepherd? Uh, Steve, you have one for us? In Hebrews 13, 20 and 21, the Lord I made the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd and the sheep, with the blood of the everlasting covenant, making complete in every good work to do his will, looking in you what is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ who can be glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so Jesus is described as the great shepherd or the chief shepherd. Okay, other passages? Rick? John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Okay, and the whole context, in fact, many of the verses there describe him as uh, the good shepherd. Uh, Bill? Isaiah 40, 11. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arms and carry them on his bosom. Okay. Lord is with young. Okay. So there are many verses we can read and a number of others that talk about God as being a shepherd. So um, what are some ways that gee, God is like a shepherd and what we are like sheep? And we'll talk about some of the course as we go through the, the psalm, but why is this an interesting or a useful illustration to think of God as a shepherd and us as his sheep? Karen? He leads us and without him we don't know the way to go, that's right. Right, so there's leadership and guidance that as a, a shepherd leads the sheep. The sheep, um, domestic sheep, are very dependent. They have very little understanding of where to go. They need the shepherd to show them how to go to the pasture, how to bring them back home to the, uh, to the fold. Um, they're very dependent on leadership. Okay? What are some other characteristics of sheep or that God is like a shepherd. Other examples? Rick? No, he keeps them safe. He watches over them. Okay, protection. They're very defenseless. Uh, they're not able to defend themselves. What are some kinds of uh, enemies that uh, sheep need to be protected from? Bill? Wolves. Wolves? Other predators, uh, uh, Susie. Uh, crevices and rocks. Uh, to fall. Okay, and, and safe places. Okay, so there's a lot of again they're defenseless, and they need protection. Whereas they have all kinds of enemies, uh, they need protection from the shepherd. So there's a number of examples we could we could think of. So what, what are some uh, people in the Bible you can think of 
that were involved with she as shepherds with sheep. Actually, there's many of the well-known characters in the Bible involved in sheep, shepherding, carrying up sheep. Can you think of some examples of some, Karen? <clears throat> Obviously, David. All right. David, which of course is especially interesting because he's the one who wrote this psalm from his experience as a shepherd. He can see the illustration of how God is like a shepherd as, as, he, as David cared for sheep, the Father's caring for him. Others who uh, were known for caring for sheep, other examples? Uh, Terry? Joseph, of course. Okay, Joseph. Okay. Who else? Well, if you go through Joseph, you can go back all the way, can't you? Joseph and his father Jacob and his father Isaac and his father Abraham. They were all shepherds, keeping sheep and, and so forth. Okay. Uh, Moses, Abel, lots of examples. Lot. Lot. Okay, so uh, this is an illustration that people, especially in Bible times, could identify with. They knew sheep or, uh, shepherds and the sheep and the uh, the work that was involved and so we have uh, a, a good example, a good illustration effective for them to understand. So I ask you then uh, as we look at this first three verses what are some blessings that God as the shepherd gives? He says, I shall not want verse 1, because the Lord is my shepherd. What does the Lord do for us in those first three verses as our shepherd? What does it say we, he does? Susie. Um, he makes me lie down in green uh, pastures where uh, um, symbolic of being uh, comfort, uh, abundance of food, and also where it was um, easily observable for the shepherd to see predators coming in and so to be protected. Okay, so he's providing sheep with green pastures and still waters. Okay. Other comments? Bill. He restores my soul. All right. Let's, okay. I want to talk about that. Okay, Karen, what are you going to say? Oh, well, I was going to say um, the still waters, sheep need still waters to drink. They can't go to a, a, a creek that's tumbling over with, with, with water. They, they need the water to be still to drink. Okay, so the idea of green pastures and still waters helps us to see that it's uh, pleasant, peaceful. Uh, there's plenty of pasture, it's green and, and uh, uh, meets their needs, the still waters. And so it seems to be, I have a picture of a, a peaceful place where their needs are abundantly met. Okay. Uh, and Bill brought up, it restores our, the soul. What's the significance of restoring the soul, uh, Rick? I got it. Uh, it's he it gives us guidance and instruction to live by. All right, that goes into the last part of it as well, leading us in the path of righteousness. Okay. So, in what sense does uh, Susie put your hand up? Comment about him restoring our soul okay. when we're when we've uh, strayed or when we're weak. He gives us strength and helps us to restore our pathway. Okay. So where our shepherd does this for the sheep, the father does this for us spiritually. Okay. Now he may bless us physically in some ways too, but the, the application to us is spiritual. That God is doing these things for us spiritually. So uh, other comments or discussion on how this is an appropriate description for our, our spiritual needs that the father provides for us. Okay, comments on the, how this blesses us spiritually. Oh, Frank. In leading us in paths of righteousness, uh, those paths are through his word. Okay, so first of all, much of what we're talking about, God is doing through the word. Uh, the paths of righteousness are in, informed us, we're informed of those paths in the scriptures. He guides us and tells us how he wants us to go. Okay? Other ways, there are blessings that God 
gives us spiritually as our shepherd. Okay, he's also then uh, giving us strength through this, the nourishment of the word gives us the spiritual strength. Uh, so not only do we have knowledge of right and wrong, but he answers our prayers, he gives us uh, strength and provides for our nourishment. Okay? Other comments on God providing us with uh, green pastures, still waters, the paths of righteousness, and so on. Terry. Just like a shepherd is never far from the flock so that he can see when they're in trouble or see the need that they have and supply. Okay. Not only is he not far from the flock, but much of the time when they're moving out, he leads the flock. The flock follows him. He doesn't just sit there and give instructions to say, do this, do that, but he's with the flock to lead them and to guide them. And God is with us spiritually, not necessarily that we would think of a physical sense, but just as the shepherd was with his sheep physically, God is spiritually with us to bless us and care for us and knows what our needs are and so on. Okay? Other comments? Sometimes we have passages, Jesus talked about like in Matthew 9, 36, that people are scattered like sheep without a shepherd. And so we have examples in the Bible where the, uh, the leaders of Israel in the Old Testament were compared to shepherds they were supposed to give the guidance to the people and care for the sick lambs and so forth, but they didn't do it. They didn't provide what was needed. Uh, they neglected the people. But God has, does not neglect us. God has, provides what we need as a, a shepherd for providing for our needs and so on. He does not abandon us. Okay? Other comments on God give the sheep and the, the shepherd. What happens when a sheep goes astray? What if a sheep strays from the flock? What happens then? Terry? Um, we know from uh, Jesus' illustration that uh, the shepherd goes out and looks for the sheep, even if it's only one of a hundred sheep he has. He, he goes out and seeks it, finds it, brings it home on its shoulder. Uh, on his shoulder to uh, <clears throat> tend to it. Okay, so one of the, again, one of the difficulties of a domestic sheep is if they wander away from the flock, they get lost, they don't know how to get back. They don't know how to find their way back there. So the shepherd has to go find them and bring them back because they won't be able to come back by their own. And so in all these ways, we need leadership and care from God, the Father, the Son, as our as spiritual shepherds for our soul and so okay? And all those things then show that God cares for us. It's not that he's just uh, going through the motions as a hireling Jesus talked about in John 10. He has a personal care for each of the sheep. Each one of us is a, a personal concern to God. He loves us and cares for each one of us. Okay. Other comments on those first three verses. Okay. Where are we here? I have my first four then. What uh, need does he describe in verse four that the Father provides for us? Verse four. And we're on to question number um, three now. Steve. Various trials and tribulations throughout our lives. Which he symbolizes as. That's the valley of the shadow of death, he says. The valley of the shadow of death. Which, obviously, death is uh, the end result of the troubles, but relates to the troubles that lead to death as well, okay? So how does, the, how does the passage describe the, what God provides for us as we pass through the valley of the shadow of death? Rick. Well, over in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing, your faith, produces patience. 
But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Okay? So as we deal with the problems of life, it makes us stronger if we have the help that we need from the Good Shepherd. Okay? Other comments on the Good Shepherd helping us when our, in times of danger. Uh, Frank. Well, even in times of uh, a dangerous situation, like illness or, or a car accident, you know, people, people die, but uh, he still protects the, the righteous, protects their soul. Even though we leave this life, he protects our soul. Okay. Other comments? Go. In, in the third Psalm, verse 6, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Okay. So, the idea of death also brings up the idea of enemies, doesn't it? Sheep are, as we mentioned, defenseless. They face great dangers. Uh, we talked about wolves and uh, David talked about how that he'd slain a lion and a bear in protecting his sheep. So there are many enemies of sheep. And the Bible compares then Satan to the roaring lion and the false teachers to wolves and so on. Uh, Jesus in John 10 talked about thieves and robbers who come to take the sheep. And so the sheep have many enemies. God is our protector spiritually to protecting us from the dangers that we face spiritually because he is our, our good shepherd to provide for us. Okay? Other comments on verse 4? Right. Just, just as David, some of his enemies were his brethren and some of his own family, even in the church, some of our enemies may be, at times, some of our brethren. Okay. And, uh, yes, which... Um, David would have experienced that, and we've seen that time and time again in the other Psalms, haven't we? He talks about his enemies, and sometimes those enemies were inside the nation, inside sometimes his own family even. Okay? Other comments on the enemies and the, the protection, uh, Terry? Well, the idea of the rod and the staff, um, the shepherd used both the crooked end, the crook of his rod, to pull back closer to him or to retrieve from a, a dangerous situation and the staff to fight against that which was trying to harm the sheep. Okay, so the rod and staff symbolize the protection of the shepherd, doesn't, don't they? His care for the sheep. Okay? Anything else through verse 4 and God's protection and provision for us? As a shepherd, not Terry Well, that idea that they comforted him, those things comforted him. So when we yeah. feel the correction of God or feel uh, his drawing us away from something, we should see that as a comfort and not something um, done to harm us. Okay, okay. All right, so then in verse... Um, five, he seems to me to get away from the illustration, uh, somewhat from the illustration of the shepherd. Uh, question number four, what blessing does he provide for us according to verse five? What do you describe in verse five as a, the blessing that he provides for us? Susan. Uh, he says he prepares a table for him in the presence of his enemies, so he provides uh, sustenance and providential care and security even in the face of enemies. Okay, so there's care, providing for care for those even when they face enemies. What else in verse 5? Karen? Um, it says, you anoint my head with oil, which lots of times in the Bible is a um, a setting apart for a special service, but as Christians, we are set apart. We are sanctified. Okay, it's a setting apart. 
What else did anointing with oil involve? And again, it's symbolic, just like the shepherd idea is symbolic. But what does what the anointing with oil symbolize besides being set apart? Susie? Um, sometimes it's uh, to show prosperity um, of, at a festive or joyous time also as a way of showing gladness. Okay, gladness, rejoicing, honor. Okay, Rick? Blessings, somebody. Blessings. And in fact, the last part, no, go ahead. Sometimes it's used for healing. Okay. Now the last part of the verse says, my cup runs over, so what does that tell us? Steve? If God's blessings exceed our capacity to contain them. Okay. So they overflow more than even what we need. God blesses us beyond what we would need. Uh, so he's picturing, uh, it seems the table idea is, uh, to me is like some of you have mentioned, a feast. God has prepared this feast for us and it's honoring us as a, as a banquet and providing for us beyond even what uh, we might expect. Okay? So all of this uh, is describing God's provision for us, his care for us, protection and providing for us. Okay? Uh, Terry. It also carries with it, I think, the idea of God's approval. Because we're in fellowship with him. Yes, because he is our, our shepherd. Now, we're not enemies. We are, we are together with him in our fellowship with him spiritually. Okay? Other comments on uh, verse 5? All right, and then he concludes in verse 6. And question number 5, what else does he give us in verse five? Six. Okay. Goodness and mercy all the days of our life. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Pretty much summarizes what the psalm says, doesn't it? God blesses with goodness and his mercy, his care. God personally cares for each one of us. He sees us and cares for us in our needs. Okay? Other comments on the last verse? <coughs> What else does it describe? Rick. It says that he will dwell in the house of the Lord, so he will follow the Lord. He will stay obedient to it. Okay. Dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So it isn't just the blessings of this life. It leads to other blessings as well. What is the significance of Rick's kind of discussed? What's the significance of dwelling in God's house? Obviously, again, it's symbolic, but what's the idea of being in God's house, Susie? Uh, well, his, his dwelling place, his presence, wherever he is, we're with him. We're not separated um, from him. Okay, back to Terry's point that uh, a closeness, a close relationship. Uh, the people that you live in this same house with, those are people that are close to you. Um, and this, and we're living in God's house. Imagine living in the house with, with God. The closeness of the fellowship, the relationship that we would have because we live in, in his house forever. So we have goodness and mercy through the life and dwell with God forever. Okay? Other comments on verse 6. Okay, anybody have anything else on the 23rd Psalm before we move on? Susie. Well, Psalm 73 verse 24 says, You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Okay, so guidance through this life and glory after this life. Okay? So we have very much contrast to some of our earlier psalms where David was talking so much about as uh, why was God helping him? Why would he need God to help him protect him from his enemies and so on? And we have a very beautiful psalm describing very poetically that God is blessing him and caring for him like a shepherd for a sheep and the lessons for us and the beauty of it of course is why it's so well known as a one of the uh, one of the psalms anything else on psalm 23 before we move on anybody rick back over in the book of james again that first chapter i think it's prevalent to us today verse five if any of you lack wisdom let him ask of god who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him.
Okay, so we're back again to the idea of God's guidance, but it goes even beyond what we need. He is liberal, generous in providing for us. Okay? All right, let's move on then to the 24th Psalm. And another very interesting psalm, I think. Let's read the 24th Psalm. Who'd like to read Psalm 24 for us, please? Psalm 24, who'd like to read that psalm for us, please? Neil, please. The earth, the, the earth is the Lord's fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your head, O gates, lift up your and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, lift, up, up, lift them up, O ancient doors, uh, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Okay. So he begins in the first two verses, uh, question number six. What does he describe as belonging to God? What belongs to God according to those first couple of verses? Question number six. See, the earth, tangible and intangible. All right, the earth and its fullness. The fullness of something is that which fills it. So the earth and that which fills the earth, which would include the plants, the animals, the people, whatever's on the earth, the earth and everything on the earth belongs to God. Those who dwell therein. Why? Why does it belong to God? Why is he in charge of it? He created it. He created it, okay? He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters, okay? It's, be it's his because he made it, okay? Question or comments? How much of the world belongs to him? The whole thing, right? In contrast to idols, where he would have maybe one God supposedly was a God over this nation, and another God over that nation, and, and so forth, that's not the biblical concept of the true God. The true God is over the whole world and everything in it uh, be because he made it, okay? Other comments on the first couple of verses? One of the commentators that I read made an interesting comment. He said, which I did not know, he said, these words are inscribed on the front of the Royal Exchange in London. Okay, like our stock exchange. So all these people, especially some of the richest people in the world, when they would go to the stock exchange in London, they see this message. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world. And all those don't go to thinking because of who you are no matter how rich you are that things really belong to you it really belongs to god he may allow us to use it but it's not already ours he's made it it belongs to him okay other comments on the first couple of verses and here again we see the importance of creation we don't really understand even why we exist. We don't understand why the world exists unless we understand creation. The doctrine of creation is so fundamental to biblical truth, biblical understanding of who we are, why we're here. Okay, so that's how he begins this 24th Psalm. Okay? Now then, the, the following verses, uh, question number seven, well, actually number eight, he has a list of qualities. He says we need to, who will ascend to the head of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place. Back to the idea of fellowship with him, the idea of a relationship with him. Who can have that kind of relationship, that kind of fellowship with God? And so he lists these four things. So I ask you to list them and uh, 
and describe other, maybe other passages for them and explain the significance and so on. So what does he say, beginning in verse 4, who is it that can stand in the holy place with the Lord? Okay. Um, he who has clean hands in, in Psalm 51.10, which says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Okay. So first of all, we have clean hands. What is the symbolic significance of the hands? The hands symbolize what? Rick? They symbolize actions. Actions, that's what we do. Our deeds. The things that we do with our hands or what we, we act with, it's symbolic, of course. But uh, because we use other things besides our hands sometimes to, to do things. Okay, so anybody have, Karen's brought up a passage, anybody have other passages that talk about our our hands and the responsibility that we have to use our hands properly for the Lord. Another passage, Frank? Uh, uh, James 4, verse 8. Uh, James says, Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Okay. Cleanse your hands. Because if you're guilty of sin, then you don't have clean hands, you see. So you, you have to cleanse your hands because you're a sinner, which is true of all of us. Okay, we need to be forgiven so we have clean hands. The other passages about the significance of hands, Steve. In Isaiah 33 and 15, he who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he who despises the gain of oppression, who gestures with his hand, using pride, stops often tears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. Okay, another passage. And we saw several passages in our study of the Minor Prophets describing characteristics of people that we need to have if we're going to have fellowship with God. Okay? Other comments on the clean hands? Okay, what else does it, does it take to stand in the holy place with the Lord? Not only clean hands, but what else? Steve? Avoid idolatry. Okay, idolatry. Let's back up to the, we'll get to that in just a minute. Let's back up to the pure heart. Uh, not only the clean hands, but the pure heart. So what would be some other scriptures about the importance of the heart? A pure heart. What does that stand for? Matthew 5, <clears throat> 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Okay, so one of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So we not only have our deeds, our clean hands, but our thoughts have to be right if we want to have fellowship with God. Pure hearts. Okay, other passages or comments on the pure hearts. Bill. Job 17, 9. Okay. Yet the righteous will hold on to his way, and he who has clean hands will be stronger and stronger. All right, so there we have the clean hands again. Okay, so the proper conduct, clean hands, and the proper thoughts are the passages on the heart. Okay, um, Proverbs 6, verse 16 through 18, the six things that the Lord hates. One of them is a heart that devises wicked plans. Okay, so we want to have fellowship with God, we have to have a pure heart. Not a heart that devises wicked plans. And so Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Your heart is where your, your thoughts are, and from it comes the things that we do. Jesus talked about that in Matthew 15 as well, didn't he? Out of the heart proceeds the things that defile a man and so on. So we need a pure heart, clean hands and a pure heart. Okay? And then also it's already mentioned uh, that would be no idols. That would, would, would include, include uh, proper worship and uh, some other translations use other words other than idols. I think of it. Neo said, uh, not idol, but something about uh, the things that we do. Anyway, okay, so what are some passages about proper worship? That our worship should be scriptural. Not only our hands, our actions, but our, what thought, our thoughts, but no idolatry. Susie. <laughs> I don't have it. John, John, they that worship God, worship him in spirit and in truth. Yes. John 
Where's that one found, folks? Worship him in spirit and truth. Where's that found? Four. Twenty-four. Very good. Okay. Other passages about proper worship. Not in contrast to idolatry. Rick. I look for the idea of laying your treasures up in heaven. Follow spiritual things. Think on spiritual things. Live for your life spiritually. Okay, in which, of course, Jesus discussed that at length, didn't he, in Matthew chapter 6, that we're not to be anxious over the things of this world, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Okay? And there are many passages we talked about in the, uh, again, in our minor prophets about the dangers of idolatry, the dangers of improper worship, and so forth. Okay? And the last of the four things was what? In verse, last part of verse 4. We must not do what? To dwell in God's house. Swear Don't swear deceitfully. Now we're talking about our speech, you see. So we have our deeds, our thoughts, our worship, and our speech all described in this uh, psalm. Do we have any other scriptures or comments or discussion on the idea of it? improper speech, swearing deceitfully, and so on? Other passages or comments on that? Terry. Ephesians 4.25, Therefore, having put away all falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Put away falsehood and speak the truth with one another. Okay? Other, other passages, comments? Frank. Uh, Ezekiel 16:59, and thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as you have done. You despise the oath by breaking the covenant. But you, make, you make a covenant with somebody, a promise, then you need to keep that covenant. Yes, we talked about that in a recent psalm, didn't we, as well? That we must be willing to keep our commitments. Keep honor our word. Okay? So our speech includes that we, we keep our commitments. Okay. So then we see, uh, it, it'll come at through verse 4. We need to finish it. Rick and then we'll move on. I'm back over to the book of James again. Verse 12 of chapter 5. It says, but, of all, but above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall in the judgment. So we don't need oaths today as Christians. We don't need to swear. We should be people of truth. People that, as in Terry's scripture, people should be able to trust us that what we say is true. All right, so then he says, the people who do this, verse 5, will receive blessing from the Lord, um, as in the generation with Jacob, but let's close with those verses 7 through 10, the last four verses. It talks about lifting up your head. Um, okay, question number 9, verse 7 through 10. Somebody's going to receive glory as he enters. Who is this talking about here? There's somebody lifts up, it says lifts up the doors, the gates. The king of glory will come in. Who is this king of glory? Well, who is he? Who's this talking about? verse 7 through 10, this king of glory that's going to come in. Who is this? God. God? Susie, what were you going to say? The Messiah. The Christ. Yes, God. Christ. The king of glory. He's going to come. So what's the significance of lifting up the gates that he may come in uh, strong and mighty? Uh, what's the significance? Again, verse 8, lift up your gates. Lift them up. Your everlasting doors. The king of glory shall come in. What's the significance of this? What's it picturing? Susie. It's a, I think, a picture of victory, a, a victor returning from battle and they cry to the city that's a walled city to open the gates and let the victor come, let the victor come in. Okay, so here's a, a triumphal entry, a ticker tape parade, we would say, for a victorious king He's been in battle. He's won the victory. Now he comes to the his city, and they open the gates and let him come in. He's victorious. And they're to honor him and glorify him. Uh, but as king of glory, 
Who is he? He's the Lord of hosts, the King of glory. Okay? So here's a description of Jesus Christ and his victory. Uh, em emphasizing the victory of Jesus God over his enemies. Okay? I'll come back to a discussion on those last four verses, seven through ten. Susan. Uh, when it says Lord of hosts, uh, yes. that uh, host, I don't know how to pronounce the word, uh, S-A-B-A-O-T-H, uh, meaning the Lord of armies, it would be spiritual or heavenly armies. Okay. Is that correct? The Lord of hosts, what's the significance of the Lord of hosts? It's the Lord of the hosts are hosts of armies, but who would that refer to? We have a number of times other passages. Uh, in fact, I, yeah, well, okay. Question number 10 doesn't specifically ask about that, but that's one of the characteristics. What are some other passages that help us understand the concept of the Lord of hosts? What have other passages? Karen? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, well, yeah, I do, actually. I was just getting, um, I've got down Psalm 46, 7. Um, okay. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And you have it again in verse 11. Okay. And there are a lot of times in Isaiah, it's frequently. Okay, so who are these hosts that this king of glory is Lord over? Who are the hosts? Comments? <laughs> okay, a terror. Well, the hosts of heaven are often spoken of, but it indicates the Creator again, the one who made everything and everything belongs to Him. Okay, so it really can refer to almost anything of all the hosts of things that God made. Sometimes it seems to refer to the heavenly bodies, the sun, moon, and stars. They're the hosts. Sometimes it's the angels. The angels are the hosts. Sometimes it's God's people. It's us. We're His hosts. But he's the Lord of all, as the Lord of hosts. So the King of glory, the Lord of hosts, he is, he is the victor. He's the winner. But And we are with him then if we have these characteristics. If we have clean heart, hands and a pure heart, and we avoid idolatry, and we don't swear deceitfully, then we are a part of his people. And we are victorious with this King of hosts as he comes in. Other comments on Psalm 24, anybody? Okay, thank you. 